ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله تعالى فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما فان اصدق الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار اما بعد we introduced ourselves to the legacy of two powerful prophets of God in our khutbah last week. And these prophets were the Prophet Moses and the Prophet Joseph, peace be upon them all. The Prophets Musa and Yusuf <coughs> alayhim as -salam. We learned how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with two main gifts on account of one condition that they met. And by the way, this happened before they were given prophethood. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching you and me a very vital lesson here. And that is, these two gifts that Allah blessed them with, every single one of us has the ability, has the capability of attaining these two gifts. In the ayah that we quoted, found in Surah Yusuf, Surah 12, Ayah 22, and Surah Qasas, Surah 28, Ayah 14, we do not see any ikhtisas in these ayat. We don't see any exclusivity in these ayat. That these two gifts were given only and only to them, and it cannot be given to anybody else. We don't see that. So Allah is teaching you and me that we have full ability to get these two gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What were these two gifts? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in these ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when Yusuf alayhi salam reached the age of maturity, when Musa alayhi salam reached the age of maturity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them with hikmah, which is wisdom, and ilm, and knowledge. And we talked about in quite a bit of detail last week what the meanings of hikmah and ilm are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they were given these two qualities. Why? وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Allah ends these ayat by saying, and that is exactly how we compensate, we reward those who not just do good deeds, but excel in their good deeds. وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ So if you and I want to get hikmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you and I want to get ilm from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you and I must work hard, must strive, must put in our very best to gain what? Ihsan, excellence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we learned, especially for our young brothers, what we learned is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that these people use their youth, they use their time in the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then only did they get ilm, and then only did they get hikmah. We learned that it is possible that a person has a lot of wisdom, but then doesn't have knowledge, and this is useless. On the other hand, someone may have a lot of ilm, but no wisdom on how to use that ilm. If a person does not have the proper wisdom, then they will look for knowledge that is utterly useless, that is utterly rubbish. It's not going to benefit them. Of what benefit is it to know things that do not help you in this world or the hereafter? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you and I can get hikmah and ilm as long as we strive to do our best. So after Allah establishes these realities, He then says in the very next ayah, found in these two different narratives, 
these two different surahs that these individuals were tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here is also an important lesson for every one of us. Life is not going to be a bed of roses. Life is not going to be a smooth ride. There will be difficulties. There will be tests from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You may have a lot in this world. That is a test for you. How do you use the resources, the good looks, the money, the wealth that Allah has given to you? And on the other hand, someone may have absolutely nothing. How will this person show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How, how would this person show thankfulness to Allah azza wa jal? So life is filled with tests to see if we are ready to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in Surah Yusuf, Surah 12, Ayah number 13, immediately after Allah mentions that he gave use of these gifts, Allah azza wa jal tells us that Yusuf alayhi salam was held captive in the same, in the very house that he grew up in. You all know the story. That Yusuf alayhi salam was one of the most handsome of men. And in his house, someone of rank, someone of beauty, tells him to commit a sin. And Allah tells us in the Quran, وَغَلَّقَتِ الْأَبْوَابِ That it's not just one door, it's series of doors. It's not just one lock, but series and latches upon latches. All of them closed. And this woman says to Yusuf, come. And Yusuf alayhi salam could have gotten away with it. Yusuf alayhi salam, nobody would have known that Yusuf did whatever he did. It would have been completely okay for him. But then Yusuf alayhi salam immediately recognizes the uncountable blessings that Allah has given to him. So Yusuf immediately says, Ma'ad Allah, I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see, this is what Ihsan is. Ihsan means to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in times, in places, in companies, in environments where you will otherwise not remem remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remembering Allah is not just when you walk into the masjid. Remembering Allah is not just when you walk into the musalla. You remember Allah the moment you step out. Who is Allah? Who cares? No, Yusuf alayhi salam remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this story, some of you may be thinking, well, I've never been tempted by this. I've never been subjected to this kind of fitna. You know what? It, it really doesn't apply to me. But this is the Quran, O Muslims. It applies to everybody, to every place, to every person. For some of you, the fitna may not be what is described in the story of Yusuf alayhi salam. For some of you, it may be the fitna of power. You may be in high positions in society, and all that is going to take you is one signature. One signature, and that shady deal is yours. The people around you, everybody is with you on the same page. Will you make the ethical choice or not? That is how the story of Yusuf affects you. You may be a young person on the college campus, in the university, in high school, in middle school, and someone comes to you, gives them you, gives you their number, and you're thinking, should I call this person, shouldn't I call this person? You're getting their friend requests on Facebook, you're getting them, you're getting their requests on your Snapchat, on your Instagram, and you're wondering, what should I do, should I do it or shouldn't I? And that is where your test of Iman comes in. So the story of Yusuf alayhi salam is not just relegated to Yusuf during his time and uh, during his era. It applies to every single one of us. Where are the young people who would follow in the footsteps of Yusuf? That at a time when you're alone in your room, the curtains are all closed, the windows, the doors, everything, you are in front of your computer screen. What are you going to do now? Are you going to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or are you going to follow your evil and your carnal desires. We move on to the story of Musa alayhi salam. In Surah Qasas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the exact thing as he mentioned in Surah Yusuf, that he blessed Musa alayhi salam with these two blessings, these two <coughs> gifts. But then Allah adds one more adjective, one more description. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمَّا بَلَغَ أَشُدَّهُ وَاسْتَوَىٰ That when Musa alayhi salam reached the age of maturity, and we learned that the age of maturity is not hitting 18 or 25 or 22 or 21. No, no, no. Maturity is when the physical, biological signs of maturity 
appear on you. That is it, regardless if you're 10 or you're 11 or you're 12, it doesn't matter. You are now an adult in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa alayhi salam, Allah says when he reached this age of maturity, and he was an extremely strong person. He was someone who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed with physical strength. Same thing. Allah said we bless him with hikmah, with wisdom, and with knowledge. Why did Allah bless him with these? Because he was greedy for good deeds. He would look for opportunities to do good deeds. So how did he use his, uh, his, uh, the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given to him? The next ayah mentions, ayah number 15. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when Musa alayhi salam went out into the city at a time when people were unaware, when people were not paying attention. Now it's a fairly long ayah, those of you who know the story, you know the story, but I want to concentrate on only this first part of the ayah. When people were not aware. What does this mean, people were not aware? What it means is some of the scholars of Tafsir bring a very fascinating point. They say that Pharaoh's Egypt was a place, as you all know, that the Bani Israel were subjected to the worst torture, worst treatment, worst oppression. From morning until night, the royal guards would make sure that the Bani Israel are completely subjugated and busy in forced labor. But there was a time during the day when they would not be doing work. They would be forced to take rest, and that was at the peak of the noon when the scorching sun was so much that you think the summer outside is bad when it's about 30, 35, 32 degrees, sometimes it doesn't even hit 35 here in our land, but there, probably 45 degrees. And so the royal guards and the slaves had to take a rest. And they are taking rest and that was the only time that Musa alayhi salam could go out and help the people. Musa alayhi salam was from the Bani Israel, but he had a royal upbringing because he was in the house of the Pharaoh. And he has might, he has prestige, he has status, he has money, he has everything a young person can ask for. But Musa alayhi salam looks for the opportunity to step out of his house. When everybody is sleeping, it takes strength to do things when nobody else is doing it. Why do you think Salat al-Tahajjud is such a big deal? It's difficult to wake up in tahajjud when everybody else is sleeping around you. Musa alayhi salam knows that everybody is resting at this time. This is my only opportunity to go and help the old lady do her chores, to help the blind person get his groceries done, to help the injured. This is what Musa is thinking. So for you and me as Muslims, as young people, and by the way, we said youth in Islam is up until the age of 40. So. For us, the lesson then is, are we looking, actively looking for opportunities to do good? Or do we just sit back and complain? That the washroom in the musalla is dirty, who's gonna clean it? That the masjid carpet is bad, that this is happening and that is happening. Well, if you think it's something bad, then you step up to the plate. Volunteer your time, look for opportunities. Do it for the sake of Allah and Allah alone. Musa alayhi salam was taking his time out to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used his strength to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For my young brothers here who are busy going to the gym, I'm not against enhancing your health or living a healthy lifestyle, but what are you working out for? Your six packs, your biceps, is it to take selfies and post on social media so that you can get likes? and comments? Or are you going to use your biceps and your six packs for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That you will take time out to go to the hospitals. You're going to take time out to visit the sick. You're going to take time out to look for initiatives within your city where you can give your time. That's what Musa alayhi salam was doing. That is the legacy that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to learn. I ask Allah Azza wa Jalla that He makes us from those who learn from His book. I ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that He makes us from those who follow in the footsteps of these mighty prophets of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Amin ya Rabbi Alamin. Barakallahu lana wa lakum fi Quran al-Karim. Wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayat wa dikri al-Hakim. Inna hum ta'ala jawad al-Karim wa malikum barukum.
الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وبعد talking about looking for opportunities to do good Allah سبحانه وتعالى has caused a particular time frame to come towards us. A time frame that is so blessed that even the days of Ramadan are not as blessed as this time frame. The Prophet ﷺ told us, hadith recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari Al upon the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas He says that the Rasul ﷺ said, there are no days in which good deeds are more beloved to Allah than these 10 days. And the companions asked, I'm surprised. They said, not even jihad in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, not even jihad in the path of Allah azza wa jal, except in the case of a man who went out with himself and his wealth and returned with absolutely nothing. Only then would this person's good deeds be higher than everybody else. But otherwise, Good deeds are multiplied tremendously. What is that time frame? That time frame is the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. The first 10 days of the 12th month of the Islamic calendar. And this time frame, inshallah ta'ala, will begin either Sunday or Monday. This coming Sunday or this coming Monday. There's a lot to talk about, inshallah ta'ala, in our khutbah next week. We'll discuss some more. But I just want to leave you with a few pointers. So what are some of the things that you and I can do in these first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah? The Prophet ﷺ left it completely open. Do whatever good deeds you are able to do. Increase in your sadaqah. Increase in your recitation of the Quran. Increase in your nafil prayers. If you are not coming to the masjid for salah, pick at least one or two times. If you can come for all five times, great. But pick one or two times that you can come to the masjid to do your salah or to the musalla to do your prayers in congregation. And one of the best deeds that you can do is to sacrifice an animal. And if you make the intention to sacrifice the animal, then the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us in, uh, in a hadith found in Sahih Muslim that when you sight the moon of Dhul Hijjah and you intend to sacrifice an animal, then abstain from cutting your hair or your nails. Now this is a, an established and emphasized sunnah. Now of course if you have your board meetings, you have a presentation to go to, perhaps you're exempted, but try your best not to because you want to show your entire body is in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what is the reward of sacrificing an animal? The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa said, the number of hair follicles on this creature, the number of hair strands on this creature, equivalent to that, you get good deeds. So increase in doing good deeds, that these 10 days are more holy and virtuous than even the days of Ramadan. So if you felt that Ramadan just slipped by, if you feel that between Ramadan and right now you've committed so many sins, <coughs> there is yet another opportunity. But of course, the days of Dhul Hijjah are not as holy as the last 10 nights of Ramadan. The last 10 nights of Ramadan are holier than the first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. But try your best to do as much as you can. From the Sunnah is that the Rasul Sallallahu would fast all nine days of Dhul Hijjah. You can fast, fast as much as you can in these first 10 days of Dhul Hijjah. Of course, we cannot fast the 10th day because the 10th day is Bakr'i. The 10th day is Eid al-Adha. It is the Eid, and we are forbidden from fasting on the day of Eid, but try your best to fast as much as you can. And if you cannot fast the first nine days of Dhul Hijjah, then at least fast the ninth of Dhul Hijjah, and that is the day of Arafah. The Rasul Sallallahu told us, Hadith in Sahih Muslim, that whoever fasts the day of Arafah, his sins of two years will be forgiven, the previous year and the coming year. Now someone may think, oh, my future sins will be forgiven. All right, I'm going to fast this, and that's it. I'll go on a sinning spree. I'll do whatever I want to do. No, 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 you can't do that. Rather, this is an incentive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do your very best. And these are related to the minor sins. If you've committed a major sin, and inshallah, none of us has, but if you have committed a major sin, and 
alcohol or zina or murder, inshallah, none of us has done that. But a major sin requires sincere tawbah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You must do sincere tawbah and Allah is the one who forgives. So seize these opportunities, become from the muhsineen, get the reward of hikmah and ilm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the beginning of the khutbah that we talked about. Become from those who are doing excellence in their good deeds with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah azza wa make us from them. Amin ya before we begin, I'd like to request all of you.